Next up, uh, we have a talk on multi-threaded test systems um, presented by Morali. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to present our work on multi-threaded test synthesis. This is a uh, joint work with uh, my PhD student, uh, Malavika Samak, at uh, the in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So over the, over the course of uh, two days since yesterday, we have been uh, looking at the various uh, aspects of testing. There has been quite a few interesting talks. Uh, there was a talk on... Uh, uh, th there are a few talks on having frameworks for writing uh, manual tests, but then uh, we also are aware of uh, manual tests being very intensive and uh, arduous task, and uh, it's not necessarily scalable. Then there was some discussion on uh, actually having uh, random tests and uh, testing uh, the entire application in a random manner, but then this also requires a uh, uh, lot of uh, testing uh, capabilities, and it is not necessarily scalable. So the discussion was pushed forward, and then uh, we talked about uh, tests from production data, trying to sample things, and then trying to see whether there are possible problems. I'm going to push this even further, and then I'm going to say, can we do targeted uh, test generation? In other words, can we somehow generate tests that will expose uh, bugs? In other words, I don't want to generate any test that is not going to expose a bug. And that is going to be the focus of this talk. And uh, this talk is in the context of um, uh, uh, in, in the context of uh, uh, concurrency bugs, detecting concurrency bugs for uh, Java classes. And uh, uh, it, it has broader implications and can, and can be applied in other contexts as well. So we are all aware of uh, what concurrency bugs are and how problematic they can be. They can be, these are some of the main reasons behind flaky bugs, and uh, we have data races, atomicity violations, and uh, deadlocks. And uh, we are also familiar that uh, application developers use uh, third-party libraries to increase their productivity and so that uh, they can build uh, reliable applications. But when you are building a multi-threaded application, and uh, you want to use uh, a third-party library or third-party class to avoid introducing concurrency bugs in your application, uh, uh, one, one can avoid this by trying to acquire logs before uh, invoking methods in these third-party classes. But then there is a significant problem because uh, we need to be aware of uh, what kinds of uh, logs need to be acquired and uh, which method uh, invocations require these acquisitions. So this is going to place uh, an unnecessary burden on the application developers. So one can think of uh, developing thread-safe classes so that this will avoid the burden on uh, the application developers. So the question is, what is a thread-safe class? A thread-safe class is as if uh, client applications invoke methods in these classes without worrying about concurrency issues. It's as if they are writing sequential code. And to give you an example of thread-safe classes to provide the context, some examples include concurrent uh, hash map blocking you from the JDK. Uh, but then somebody has to do the heavy lifting. How do you ensure thread safety of a class? Right? Testing for concurrency issues in general is challenging. I'm going to show you an example of how uh, challenging it is by looking at a fairly popular code base. So there is this library called uh, Hazelcast. It's an open source Java library, uh, essentially used for uh, uh, application in uh, highly concurrent uh, multi-threaded contexts. It's an actively developed library. Uh, in the last uh, year or so, there have been uh, those many commits and uh, quite a few releases and so on. And uh, if you look at one of the classes, synchronized uh, right behind queue, it is declared th thread safe in the Java docs. Uh, essentially, this means the clients need not, using these classes need not acquire any additional locks. And using our analysis, using the tools that we developed in our lab at IASC, we were able to figure out that this class is not thread safe. And we were not even aware of what this class is doing, what kind of, uh, what kind of product is this. We just did our analysis in an automated manner, and we were able to declare that this class is not thread safe. Because there is a corner case that leads to a race. And uh, to manifest this race, it requires a very complex uh, multi-threaded test. 
I'll tell you how the test looks like. To actually expose the rays, one needs to uh, one needs to spawn two threads. And these two threads need to invoke two methods. Say, in this case, two invocations for remove first. Not only that, the invocation needs to happen on two different objects, A and B. Not only that, you also need to make sure that the field Q of these two different objects, A and B, points to the same object as shown in the figure. Now, if you provide a test like this, then you can have an assertion that says there is a data race. But somebody has to write a test like this. In other words, the question is, which methods need to be invoked concurrently? Because I can look at all possible pairs of invocations, but then that is alone is not sufficient. What parameters need to be passed to these methods? And then that becomes completely combinatorial. Right? And this is a hard problem. So how do we detect threat safety violations? Traditional software testing is ineffective in the context of uh, testing multi-threaded applications. Because there is varied behavior for the same input. It completely depends upon the schedule that is being explored. We need to run on multiple schedules, and therefore the number of schedules is simply unmanageable and therefore not scalable. There has been a lot of work on source code analysis. Companies like Coverity, for which I used to work for some time back, they provide uh, static analysis tools to expose uh, defects, comprehensive coverage of defects, but then they also have uh, false positives. In other words, the developer has to go and then say whether this is indeed a true bug or not. And that can, be, that can also be a hassle. So what we propose here is, why not do dynamic analysis? What is dynamic analysis? Dynamic analysis is, you have a class that you want to test for a threat safety violation. You have a test that invokes, you have a multi-threaded test that invokes the various uh, methods in this class. And when this test is run, the dynamic analysis engine will analyze the execution trace and then report possibility of concurrency bugs. And there has been a lot of uh, work in this area in the past uh, decade or so to find the various kinds of uh, concurrency bugs, races, deadlocks, atomicity violations, and so on. But the key problem, most of these uh, work have been in the academic circles. And uh, they all focus on trying to develop this dynamic analysis engine, the thing that you see in uh, green there. But the question is, it requires a multi-threaded test. And writing these tests is hard. And you need to develop a complex scenario for these analysis engines to actually expose the bug. For example, in the scenario that I mentioned previously for Hazelcast, these uh, tools will fail if the proper test is not provided. So we ask this question. This is Malavika's uh, doctoral dis dis dissertation work. Can we somehow synthesize these tests automatically? That will help the dynamic analysis engines. And this is the goal of the work, and the goal, and, and uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So why not do randomized uh, test generation? So I have a class with multiple methods, M1 through M9, and a basket full of parameters represented by different colors to represent different objects. I can invoke all possible pairs of methods from two different threads. Not only that, I can provide all possible combinations of objects to these. Right? That alone is not sufficient. The objects need to be in such a state that this problem can manifest. And uh, that is simply not scalable, because you may have one test somewhere sitting there where you will find a bug. And you may miss lots of bugs. And so the goal is, somehow, given this class and possible parameters, spawn two threads, find two method invocations, and then find the appropriate set of objects that need to be passed to these two invocations. And then somehow, magically, there will be a bug in this test. Right? And some of you may be wondering, wait a minute. You just said dynamic concurrency bug detection requires effective tests. And now you are saying test synthesize, but then how do I 
synthesize the tests in a targeted manner because I need to know where the defects are. And I didn't know it to start with. So this is a conundrum. How do I solve this problem? So this is the problem statement. How do I synthesize multi-threaded tests that expose these concurrency bugs? And the key insight is most of the code repositories will have sequential tests. And writing sequential tests is not as hard as writing multi-threaded tests. So we can leverage this. And uh, we can analyze the execution traces of sequential tests to construct these multi-threaded tests. To provide you an overview, you just take a class and uh, a set of sequential tests. You provide it to our synthesizer, and that will output a multi-threaded test, or set of multi-threaded tests. So I'm going to, we have done um, work on synthesizing tests, tests for uh, exposing various kinds of concurrency bugs. But in this talk, I'm going to uh, give you an instance of how we do this for uh, detecting atomicity violations. So before I delve into how do we do this, let me tell you how, what an atomicity violation is. So we have two threads here, T1 and T2. There are uh, shared memory accesses represented by these cartoons. Uh, P represents a previous access, C represents a current memory access, R represents a remote memory access. There is no atomicity violation on this execution. So assume that this was an execution. The remote access happened before P and C, R happened before P and C. There is no atomicity violation. But then on some other case, R can happen between P and C. And then that is a problematic scenario. That is an atomicity violation, right? Now you can think of just putting locks, wrapping it around locks, and then be, assume that it is safe. But in many cases, it won't be safe. Because if you can find a scenario where the lock objects are different, as represented by different colors for these locks, yellow and green, you still have an atomicity violation. You have different locks, and you have uh, uh, interleaving, which causes a problem. And the goal is how to generate these tests. And there are a number of challenges in uh, synthesizing multi-threaded tests from sequential tests. So let's say I have these sequential tests, T1 through Tn. And uh, each test makes a sequence of uh, read and write accesses. And because these are sequential tests, there is no notion of uh, shared memory location. So how do I find these access triplets, three accesses, P, C, and R, such that this will expose an atomicity violation? There may be some access triplet RRW in these two sequential tests, that when put together can cause a problem. How do I identify that? Once I, even if I identify that, how do I ensure that there are accesses in my test that will expose these accesses? I mean, uh, it, it will trace through that path, right? There may be some methods M1 and M4 through which these accesses happen. How do I find these methods and the paths? Okay, but. As I said, these are uh, different. There is no notion of shared memory access, so the accesses can happen on two different memory locations. But the atomicity violation needs to happen on the same shared memory location. Now, how do I construct a scenario such that the objects that are being passed to M1 and M4 are such that when they go to the actual accesses, these become the same memory location, right? And then finally, how do I generate objects? that can be legal and that can be provided to the setter, which will pass it to the methods and then expose these uh, accesses. Right? So to summarize the challenges, we need to identify the access triplets, identify the APIs to be invoked concurrently, set the appropriate context, and use legal object instances. So I'll take a simple contrived example to explain how we do this in our tool. So, to identify access triplets, let's assume we have an input sequential test. The input sequential test uh, invokes every method in a class with random objects. And there are tools that can do this for you. Um, or a developer can just write these, uh, and the time is going to be linear in the number of uh, methods. So here we have uh, um, methods evaluate, reset, and set uh, invoked on objects A1, A2, and A3. For simplicity of presentation, I have removed the keyword synchronized and replaced it with locks and unlocks. So there is uh, a lock uh, at, uh, before evaluate is being invoked on object A1, represented by the green lock. And then uh, 
uh, temp is equal to this dot f, and then uh, there is a temp dot g not equal to null. The value is assigned to flag, and this happens within a locked context on a different object represented by the yellow color. And then subsequently, there is a check of if flag asserts something, and then the lock is released. There is a, another method, reset, and the, that has uh, temp is equal to this dot f, and then temp dot g is equal to null. And uh, there is a set that will just set whatever value is passed to it, and then it says this dot f is equal to f. And there is an atomicity violation here between uh, uh, invocations to evaluate and reset, just to set the context. Now observe that uh, the, if you just take this multi, if you just take the sequential test, the objects and the locks that are happening are completely different. So if you just piece these two things together, you are not going to be able to expose any atomicity violation, right? Um, so let's see how we can identify the access triplets. We say we'll identify the access triplets as follows. It needs to access the same field. The P and C accesses need to be consecutive accesses. And the PCR accesses should, are, are such that they need to be of the following type. It should be a read, read, write, 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 read, uh, write, sorry, uh, read, write, write, and uh, write, read, write. These are the scenarios where the atomicity violation can happen in reality. Other, other four combinations will not uh, cause a problem. So in the example here, we see that if we say P, C, and R as represented in the slide, they access the same field, and that is this dot f. And P and C are indeed consecutive accesses. And uh, P, C, R accesses satisfy that pattern. right? So this is indeed an interesting access triplet, so we'll keep this. Observe that the logs that are being acquired around these accesses are also interesting. So the log that is being acquired consistently around uh, this dot f in evaluate is only the green lock. The yellow lock is just held and then released uh, after each access. So that is not interesting. So only the green lock becomes interesting. And for reset, there is only the red lock. So we need to make sure that the logs a1 and a2 represented by green and red should not be the same. If they are the same, concurrent access is not possible. right? Not only that, um, we need to ensure that the location a1.f.g needs to be the same as a2.f.g. And only then, there will be a shared memory access. So that's another constraint that we need to have to ensure violation. And if we have the object state as follows, a1.f points to g, a2.f points to g, then we indeed will have a problem. right? Now we need to construct a scenario like this. How do I identify the APIs? I have executed the sequential test. I know where the methods are, what are the methods that causes these accesses. So I just pick these methods. In this case, it's simply evaluate and reset. Finally, I need to set the context. So this is the desired object state for the violation to happen. And there was one interesting method sitting right there, set f. And uh, set f just sets this dot f is equal to f. Now, I can take some object a1, pass it f1, a1 dot set of uh, uh, v1, and then that will reset the pointer of a1 dot f to whatever object is being passed. I can take another random object, call this method, and then that will also reset it. And this is indeed the object state that I required. Right? I have now set the context. Now I need legal object instances. I can simply do this by using the sequential test. I can use, take that as an object generator. right? I'll take the sequential test, and whenever I want objects for invoking a method for, as parameters or re receiver, I'll just execute the sequential test up to the invocation point, capture the objects, and then use that for the invocation. So in this case, I need objects for two invocations of set and an evaluate and a reset. So in the first case, I'll just execute the sequential test, stop it at set, get the objects. I'll do the same for another invocation of set. For evaluate, I'll do the same. And for reset, I'll do the same. So I have collected all the objects that are required. And all I need to do is, remember there is a constraint that we had. I'll just use those constraints to rearrange the objects, and then this will be the test that I generate. 
So essentially, I'll call o1.set of o2, o3.set of o2, and then invoke, evaluate, and reset concurrently. And this will indeed be the required test case. You can go back and then see that there is indeed, uh, this will expose an atomicity violation given the appropriate schedule, right? So we have implemented tools for this. Uh, so essentially, we have this dynamic analysis engine, and uh, that is split into two phases. One is the test synthesis, and the second is the defect detection and reproduction. Um, we have tools for deadlocks, ex uh, synthesizing tests for exposing deadlocks, for data races, and uh, atomicity violations. We have also uh, a tool for detecting and reproducing uh, deadlocks, and we are also working actively on uh, having tools for uh, uh, the other atomicity violations and races as well. We have uh, performed uh, experiments on this. We have implemented using uh, the uh, suit bytecode analysis framework and evaluated it on open source Java libraries. And uh, for the sequential test, we just invoked each method in the class once with random objects. That will be the driver. Uh, when we tested this on 10 to 15, uh, Fairly well-tested uh, Java classes. Some of them are indeed thread-safe. Some of them are from the JDK, right? Older versions of the JDK. Things like string buffer, synchronized collection, and so on. We were able to detect uh, 187 races, and these are harmful races. This will cause some exception behavior, exceptional behavior. 79 atomicity violations and 81 deadlocks. And the interesting thing is the time overhead for synthesizing these tests is very minimal. It's less than 25 seconds per class, right? And uh, these are indeed real defects. We had reported this problem to the Hazel CAS developers, and uh, they indeed uh, fixed the bug. And they fixed the bug by not changing the code, but by changing the documentation from thread safe to thread unsafe. <laughs> so the tools are available uh, from our web page. And that is the link to our page. These are available as uh, VM images. Um, all the three tools are part of the same VM image as well. I'll just show you some snapshots of our tool. Um, this is the example uh, class, foo. And this has, when you invoke this concurrently, it will cause a uh, atomicity violation here. And uh, the sequential test that we have is uh, given below. Uh, just create an object library and then call the method foo. And then intruder is atomicity violation uh, engine. And uh, you specify the user specified test, user specified test, test2.test, and then run it. It will create uh, a summary.txt, test driver 0.java. It will tell you the time it took to synthesize the test and the number of tests generated. And the test driver looks something like this. It will initialize the objects, get the objects that are used for the test. It will impose the necessary constraints for the problem to manifest, spawns multiple threads, invokes the appropriate uh, methods, and uh, that's it. And uh, that will cause a problem. And we also have integrated with third party uh, tools, some of them implemented by us, some of them uh, that are already available, and uh, to expose the violations. One part is synthesizing these tests. Second part is actually reporting bugs. We have also done that. And uh, so you just need to turn the detector on for the problems to manifest. So in this case, we generate the test and also report uh, the uh, atomicity violations also. So in summary, we have uh, designed tools for synthesizing multi-threaded tests. The input to the tools require the Java class and the test, sequential tests that invoke each method in class with random parameters. This has broader implications other than uh, uh, whatever I have spoken here, and we are actively, our research group is actively working on that. These tools have been uh, helpful in detecting harmful concurrency bugs uh, with negligible time overhead, and uh, the tools are available at that link. And last but not the least, thank you, Google, for uh, fun generously funding our research activities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ooh, questions. Uh, do you only consider a single class, or you can 
can you find bugs across multiple class APIs? Um, we can indeed uh, find bugs uh, across multiple class APIs. Uh, the main constraint is uh, the kinds of sequential tests that you provide. So if you piece together multiple APIs, multiple uh, APIs from multiple classes, it, we, our tool should be able to handle that. Um, so instead, the locks are timing specific. How do you control them in tests? Uh, so uh, indeed, deadlocks are timing specific, and we do not uh, control them uh, during the test generation process. We set up just the context to expose this problem. And then we have a tool that will essentially do some kind of fuzzing to expose uh, the problematic behavior, and then reproduce the problematic behavior to report the bug. But we just need to synthesize the test. We need to have the scenario for this problem to happen. And that's what we do in this work. Um, can the tool identify concurrency issues by reading the source code where the class and methods under test have been used across multiple classes, packages, et cetera? Uh, by reading the. Uh, we haven't uh, done anything with respect to. Uh, I think it looks like more a question on natural language processing and trying to. Uh, uh, trying to integrate that and then trying to find bugs. Uh, right now, our tool is not uh, there yet, but uh, that's a good point for future work. Um, is this open source? Uh, sorry, no. I used to work for a company that uh, made big business by uh, selling uh, program analysis tools. So we hope that we'll be able to commercialize it at some point. Um, could it, the tool identify locks needed to fix issues instead of just detecting issues? Uh, that's a harder problem uh, because of, uh, f f fixing means we, are, we need to provide guarantees. So rather than fixing, probably our tool can help in giving uh, hints to the developer so that that can be used to actually address the problem. Uh, do you have any data on the coverage of scenarios? The tool depends on existing sequential tests, so I assume you can only uncover multi-threaded bugs for which some tests already exist. So yes, uh, the multi-threaded bugs will be exposed only if uh, the code, uh, if the tests already cover some region. But there has been a lot of work on uh, synthesizing uh, sequential tests itself. There has been work since 2005 on automatically doing concolic testing and then automatically generating sequential tests. So uh, all if. Uh, Man, if these sequential, if these tests are not written manually, this can also be generated automatically. The sequential test can be generated automatically. That is still problematic. But then we can use this and then uh, try to uh, uh, generate the concurrent concurrence, concurrent tests. Um, how do you explicitly control the scheduling of the threads to expose an issue? Uh, I think this goes back to the question on uh, deadlocks as well. So for example, there will be a dynamic analysis engine uh, where we can, while, execution, while executing the program, we can maintain a data structure separately. So if, you, if I am looking for uh, deadlocks, I can just try to see whether the kinds of locks I am acquiring will lead to a cycle in some log graph that I maintain, and that can report a deadlock. So therefore, it is completely uh, independent of the timing of uh, the execution. So and there has been a lot of work on this. A lot of material is available, so you can look at that too. Um, and would the and how would the quality of sequential tests affect your analysis? Uh, the quality of the sequential tests is indeed uh, 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 a critical part of uh, how good our analysis is. Uh, mainly, it needs to ensure that uh, there is uh, good coverage of the various accesses, and as long as that is provided, our uh, uh, multi-thread test will be able to uh, expose the problem. But if the region itself is not touched by the sequential test, then our analysis will not be able to report uh, the problem there, because it has not seen the access to start with. Um, and I believe the last question is, do you have plans to expand your tools to other languages beyond Java? Uh, yes, we are indeed looking at uh, trying to uh, uh, develop this tool for uh, C, C++. The kind of analysis that needs to happen for C, C++ will be significantly different from uh, what is done for Java. And so we are actively looking at that too. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.